Welcome, Excellencies, dear Madam Special Rapporteur, ladies and gentlemen, dear activists and women's rights defenders, dear colleagues and supporters. I'm Patricia Elias from Every Woman uh, Treaty, the grassroots coalition of more than 3,000 women's rights activists from 147 countries. We are pleased to welcome you to the special event we are organizing for the 16 days of activism uh, uh, against gender-based violence, unite the need for an optional protocol to CEDO to end violence against women and girls. Allow me first to express our gratitude to the brilliant defenders of women's and girls' rights who have graciously accepted to lead our webinar today, mostly the four nations, Costa Rica, Sierra Leone, Antigua and Barbuda, and Democratic Republic of Congo. In the person of the Honorable uh, Samantha Marshall, Minister of State responsible of, for Gender Affairs, and His Excellency Joy D. Davis Lake, Minister Counselor from Antigua and Barbuda, his Excellency Minister Councillor Serge Ndai and His Excellency Ambassador Paul M. Poli from Democratic Republic of Congo. The thanks also goes to His Excellency Ambassador Dr. Lansanak Berry representing Sierra Leone, who will not be able to join but sends Sierra Leone unconditional support. And last but not, not least, Their Excellencies Ambassador Christian Guillermo Fernandez and Her Ambas uh, Excellency Ambassador Shara Duncan. Villa Lobos representing Costa Rica for their leadership and all along this process. Allow me also to express my gratitude to Ms. Rima Salem, Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, Its Causes and Consequences, for her leadership and unconditional commitment and dedication to ending violence against women and girls. Ms. Dubravka Simonovic, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls and former Chairperson of the CEDO Committee, and Mrs. Rashida Manju, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Vice Against Women and Girls. And finally, Mr. Mubarak Idris from Every Woman Coalition's Emerging Leader Council. As we all know, Vice Against Women and Girls is the most widespread human rights violation on earth affecting all of humanity. At least one in three women experience, experience intimate partner violence or sexual violence in their lifetime. The statistics the World Health Organization describes as devastatingly pervasive. The latest number from UN Women 2022 found that on average, more than five women or girls are killed every hour by someone in their own family. In September 2023, UN Women reported that no country is within reach of eradicating intimate partner violence and that we as a global community are failing women and girls. We are gathered today to hear the voices of our panelists in calling for the implementation of an optional protocol to CEDO to put an end to violence against women and girls worldwide. Allow me to give the floor. Uh, let me see if um, we have the, uh, okay. Uh, Minister of Antigua and Barbuda uh, should have uh, opened the floor uh, uh, with read the joint statement of the core group of friends. Apparently she is uh, not yet um, uh, connected. So, so uh, let us start by the welcome remarks by His Excellency, Mr. Paul M. Poli from Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, it will be a recorded video because uh, of previous commitment, commitment. He is on a plane for the moment. So please let me share his video. Excellencies, dear colleague, dear participant. First of all, I would like to wish you on behalf of the organizer of this event on Unite the Need for an Optional protocol to CEDO to end violence against women and girls, a cordial welcome to all. I would also, and above all, like to thank you for your presence, testimony to the interest we have in this very important subject. This reassures us that many of us are indeed concerned about the problem and want to seek effective and lasting solutions. Excellencies, the few statistical data that were recalled in the concept note that was distributed for this meeting gives an overview of the level of damage that violence against women and girls causes every day. On average, more than 133 women and girls are killed every day 
by a member of their own family, not to mention other damage. This is huge, and you are right to mobilize and denounce this evil. However, we must not limit ourselves to simply denouncing the problem and not trying to solve it together. Violence against women and girls must end, and it must happen now. We have waited too long, and during this time, impunity sets in and diversifies to the detriment of all these women and girls who are killed. We must not continue to count and cry for our mothers, our sisters, our children every day, and yet we have the possibility of stopping this massacre. Also, by organizing this meeting, we want you to invite you to join the call launched by the group of friends, namely Costa Rica, Democratic Republic of the Congo, Sierra Leone, Antigua and Barbuda, as well as the special rapporteur and every woman for the materialization of the will of all and to put an end to this tragic violence. Join us in the drafting, adoption, and implementation of an optional protocol to the Convention of the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women's Pseudo in short. This treaty constitutes a significant step forward in the fight for gender equality and against certain forms of violence against women, such as human trafficking, early marriage, and child marriage, etc. We must consolidate this important achievement with a protocol which expressly mentions rape and other forms of violence and aggression. A protocol that will take into account and consolidate the Belém de Para and Istanbul Convention as well as the Maputo Protocol to make it a universal and binding text for all and adequately protect women and girls around the world by not leaving none of them aside. The DRC's appeal was launched from the highest political level of the state by the President of the Republic, His Excellency Mr. Félix Antoine Sekedi Chilombo, who, then President of the African Union, had called for a new international treaty to the occasion of the Unorigra African Union Men's Conference on Positive Masculinity, of which he is the champion in Africa. He renewed this call to member states during the 52nd session of the Human Rights Council by asking them to join the DRC, Costa Rica, and Sierra Leone within the coordination group and the group of friends for the conclusion of a treaty, better an optional protocol to see Excellencies, this afternoon meeting is not a routine, but a pressing invitation to all partners to understand the urgent nature of putting in place this new optional protocol to CEDO to eradicate violence against women and girls. Today, that all stakeholders around the world agree and support the call for a binding text to put an end to this curse, what can stop, block us from moving forward? Nothing. So let's go for the disappearance of violence against women and girls in all its form. Excellent meeting, everyone. I thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to uh, Ambassador Impoli. And uh, I give the, we now give the floor to Mr. Mubarak Idris, Every Woman Coalition's Emerging Leader Council, for his perspective on violence against women and girls. Uh, Mubarak, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you so much, Pratisha. I would like to thank the Every Woman Coalition for allowing me to speak briefly on this important topic. In our advocacy ecosystem, specifically those fighting to end gender-based violence, there exists a lot of challenges, but for the next three minutes, I would like men to focus on a foundational step towards mitigating this harmful act of abuse rooted in inequality. And that is to recognize and challenge our own biases against women and girls. Let's just take a moment for introspection to look at the data. Do you know that it has been reported that one in two women have suffered violence or know someone who has experienced violence since the COVID-19 pandemic? Do you know that on average, femicide is responsible for more than five women or girls being killed every hour by someone in their own family? According to a survey in 2018 by UNICEF, one in four Nigerian girls has experienced physical or sexual violence. Let me take you down memory lane. About 10 years ago, on April 14, 2014, 
The Boko Haram movement launched one of their most high profile attacks when they abducted 276 schoolgirls, which sparked the hashtag Bring Back Our Girls movement. These girls were raped, forcefully converted, forced into labor, and radicalized. Currently, as I speak to you, 38 female students of the Federal University of Guso in Zamfara State just clocked 76 days in bandit captivity. This is a clear example of how women and girls are being targeted and suffer more during the times of conflict. Now, the options for men to be allies are limitless. You can amplify women's voices, lend an attentive ear when women speak, share information on local helplines and shelters, and actively support their engagements and contributions. You can also endorse laws, policies, and protocols combating all forms of violence locally and globally. This is why it is imperative for us as men to unite and urge world leaders to adopt an optional protocol to CEDAW. An optional protocol to CEDAW will build on the countless successes of CEDAW in the past 40 plus years. The protocol holds the potential to transform global norms in addressing violence against women and girls by establishing clear definitions and standards, signaling an end to impunity. Cyber violence, for example, is a new and evolving form of violence affecting 73% of women worldwide. Women and girls represent 65% of all trafficking victims, of which more than 90% are trafficked for sexual exploitation and violence against women and girls cost the world about $4.7 trillion annually. We need a comprehensive and legally binding instrument that protects every woman and girl across the globe. For us to live in a world where every woman is safe, our actions as men must mirror our intentions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Idris, because you are reminding us that this uh, this fight is women and men hand in hand. Thank you so much for representing the positive masculinity with us tonight, today, to this afternoon. It depends for where you live in the whole world. So, and now I am pleased to give the floor to Ms. Rima Salem, Special Rapporteur on Vice Against Women and Girls, Its Causes and Consequences. Mrs. Asalem, the floor is yours. Thank you, Patricia. Uh, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, I would really like to welcome you all that are joining us from uh, all over the world to this uh, webinar. I would also uh, like to extend a very warm welcome uh, to you, your excellencies and representatives of Antigua and Barbuda, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Sierra Leone and Costa Rica, and also for your initiative in putting together and leading a core group of friends uh, for the optional protocol. And of course, uh, a big thank you to you, Patricia, and uh, a welcome also to Mubarak from Every uh, Woman Coalition for organizing this webinar. And I also would like to welcome and acknowledge the presence of my predecessors, two of them, Mrs. Rashida Manju and uh, Mrs. Sim uh, Dubravka Simonovic, uh, and also to thank them for uh, being here uh, for this important meeting. So in a nutshell today, uh, and on behalf really of myself and my two predecessors who are here, we would like to, I would like to convey our belief that the time has come in our view uh, to have an international treaty dedicated to ending gender-based violence against women. We believe it would be a timely and effective way of advancing gender equality and non-discrimination, of ending violence and achieving greater accountability and justice for the crimes committed against uh, women and girls. So let me explain uh, why. We have already heard from the previous speakers about how pervasive uh, violence against women is. In fact, it continues to be at uh, epidemic levels. Uh, we also know within those that uh, those realities that women and girls continue to be uh, killed because they are uh, women and girls and continue to be uh, subjected to gender-related uh, killings. And on that, in fact, uh, the, the report by uh, UNODC and UN Women for 2022 on femicide just came out. 
And uh, in that year, nearly 89,000 women were killed. And this is the highest year number recorded in the past two decades. So all this to show that really this issue is not going away. It's still very much uh, here with us. Now, of course, we recognize that the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and also the committee overseeing its implementation, the CEDAW committee, they have played an important role in ensuring that the term discrimination against women um, is appropriately dealt with, but also that it implicitly and explicitly covers violence against women. So General Recommendation 19 of 1992 did that by framing violence against women as a form and manifestation of gender-based discrimination that is used to subordinate and oppress women. And in doing so, it unequivocally brought such violence outside of the private sphere and into the realm of human rights. And as you know, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur, which turns 30 next year, um, also uh, worked in the same uh, direction, and in fact was established uh, with that in mind. Then you have General Recommendation 35, which superseded General Recommendation 19, and which recognized gender-based violence as a norm of international customary law. Now, of course, the committee continued to also issue other recommendations, establishing measures for combating and preventing violence against women in line with its jurisprudence and uh, monitoring. So this is all very good. And of course, these recommendations provide authoritative interpretations of uh, uh, CEDAW and also provide very important and useful guidance for state parties on the implementation of their obligation under the convention. Uh, however, the, the, the concern is that the much needed improvements in law and in practice to address violence against women at national level, at regional level, um, uh, and international levels uh, are yet to take uh, effect uh, uh, today. So similarly also, uh, we do acknowledge the importance of the impact of the specific regional treaties. And of course, the very important role uh, that they have played in preventing and responding to violence against women and girls um, in those region. They have gone a long way in defining the different forms of violence that all women and girls experience, as well as seeking accountability and redress for women and girls who are survivors of violence. And my position and that of my predecessor has of course been that states should ratify these treaties where they have not, and of course should continue to apply their provisions very robustly particularly since they are tailored to the needs and realities of the regions for which they were designed. Nevertheless, history has shown that the lack of a universally accepted legal framework um, continues to be a stumbling block. Uh, we continue to need one that explicitly defines and spells out the various forms of violence against women uh, from an international perspective that criminalizes it and that sets out prevention and protection measures and that does so in a binding way, especially that uh, in addition to all the realities, the grim realities we have, uh, I have mentioned, we are now also confronting um, as women uh, and as girls uh, emerging global challenges that are exacerbating uh, the exposure uh, to violence and that are intensifying uh, its consequences. We know what COVID-19 has done. We know about the gendered impact of climate change. And we all can see the proliferation of uh, conflict with its uh, devastating consequences uh, for women and girls. Uh, today, especially, I would say, where the credibility of international law is at stake um, and where also uh, sexual violence continues to be used as a tool of war and where um, civilians that have been afforded uh, protections in international humanitarian law and women uh, also and children also um, really cannot benefit uh, from these uh, as, as we can see. And then we have the very uh, particularly grim situation in Afghanistan, which really uh, remains um, uh, sort of the, the, the lowest point in, in how low um, the situation of women and girls can get with the systematic discrimination and marginalization 
uh, of uh, women based on their sex uh, and gender in ways uh, that we have not really seen in any other uh, country. So um, this, in addition to also the fact that we see new forms of violence rooted in misogyny and patriarchy exercised online and offline, not only affecting the lives of women, uh, of course, their, their families, their participation in society, but it, I would say it also affects the development of uh, societies and uh, their prosperities. So to ensure that uh, all what we have uh, nevertheless achieved in terms of uh, minimum uh, standards is not compromised, we feel very strongly, therefore, that this international treaty should continue uh, to basically be uh, annexed or part uh, and an answer to uh, the CEDAW convention so that it remains within uh, that uh, th threshold at least of global standards that have been achieved uh, so far. So uh, together with Rashida and Dubravka, we uh, obviously welcome very much the interest expressed by some states and also civil society organizations in uh, working towards a protocol we very much would like to call on other states to follow suit. And uh, we think that the United Nations member states, together with the committee, hopefully, other regional international human rights mechanisms, as well as civil society, could uh, come together, or it would be great if they did, to embark collectively on a formal process of stock taking, see where we are, um, and also to uh, start discussing a detailed content of the treaty, the detailed objective of uh, such a treaty. Of course, this process will take time. It will uh, take several years at best, but uh, we do have to uh, start somewhere. And in all of this, of course, women human rights defenders, women-led organizations, victims have to be uh, an integral and an equal part of that. So uh, I will stop here and of course to reiterate uh, on my behalf, uh, but I'm sure also on behalf of my predecessors, that uh, we stand ready to support this process and also uh, to put our expertise um, at your disposal. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mrs. Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women and Girls, Its Causes and Consequences, Mrs. Rima Saleh. Uh, Salim. Um, uh, uh, I would like to welcome uh, the Honorable Samantha Marshall, Minister of State responsible of Gender Affairs from Antigua and Barbuda that has uh, joined. Uh, Good day. Today, uh, would you like please to read us the joint statement of the core group of friends? Thank you very much and my apologies for, for being a little us. late. <laughs> um, this is a joint statement by the core group of friends of a new op optional protocol to CEDA to eradicate violence against women and girls. As we embark on the annual 16 days of activism against gender-based violence, we express our collective alarm at the increase in violence against women and girls across the globe. Reports abound on the recent rise of sexual violence taking place as a result of war and conflict. Incidents of violence against women and girls have increased since the COVID-19 pandemic. New forms of violence, such as online violence and technology-enabled violence have become widespread. Estimates suggest that as many as 73% of women experience online violence. Levels of domestic violence remain high in every country in the world. Every 11 minutes, a woman is killed by her partner or a family member. Each climate catastrophe is followed by higher levels of multiple forms of violence perpetrated on women and girls. We know, however, that conflict, climate change, and public health emergencies exasperate violence, but they do not cause it. Violence against women and girls is entrenched in global norms in every nation. We therefore issue our urgent appeal to UN member states to join the call for the creation, adoption, and implementation of a new optional protocol to the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, also known as CEDAW. 
dedicated to eradicating violence against women and girls. We stand ready to work with all UN member states, ready to deliver lives free from violence for every woman and girl. And this has been signed off by His Excellency, Mr. Boris Latour, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenitentiary to the Permanent Mission of Antigua and Barbuda to United States. His Excellency, Mr. Christian Golanef Fernandez, Ambassador, Permanent Mission of the Republic of Costa Rica to the United Nations. His, Her Excellency, Mrs. Shara Duncan, the Albos, Ambassador, Permanent Mission to the Republic of Costa Rica to the United Nations. His Excellency, Mr. Paul M. Paul Losco, MFAM, um, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenitentiary, Permanent Mission of the Democratic Republic of the Congo to the United Nations. And His, His Excellency, Mr. Lanza Geber, Ambassador Permanent Mission of the Republic of Sierra Leone to the United Nations, Geneva. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Samantha Marshall, Minister of State responsible for gender affairs from Antigua and Barbuda, to have read the joint statement for the core group of friends. Uh, I just wanted to um, remind everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A, not in the discussion. And the Q&A, uh, uh, please, for us to be able to answer your questions. Uh, and uh, now I would uh, like to give the floor to Ms. Dubravka Simonovic, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Vice Against Women and Girls, and former Chairperson of the CEDO Committee. Uh, Mrs. Simonovic, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patricia. Greetings to all. Madam Minister, Your Excellencies, colleagues and friends, all those present on this webinar, uh, especially all representatives of core group of friends that are supporting this optional protocol to see the convention. Uh, it is very important that we are meeting on this uh, important 16 days uh, dedicated to elimination of violence against women and addressing the need for optional protocol to the CEDO convention that will further strengthen all our efforts to prevent and combat gender-based violence against women and girls. You may recall that um, as a former special rapporteur, during my uh, term, I have uh, prepared specific report on adequacy of international legal framework on violence against women that was presented to General Assembly in 2015. And for that report, I have invited uh, different stakeholders holders to send me their inputs. I have at that time received 291 submissions uh, that could be grouped under three different options. First um, group was group of those civil society organizations and uh, mechanisms like Special Rapporteur on Rights of Women in Africa that considered that international legally binding treaty on violence against women was needed based on argument that there is a normative gap on violence against women in international law framework. A uh, second group was group of civil society organizations as well as monitoring mechanisms like CEDO committee and Gravio committee that is monitoring implementation of Istanbul convention that opposed such a new standalone treaty on violence against women, but they proposed a better support for existing instruments and mechanisms claiming that normative gap was closed by CEDO general recommendations. And uh, third group was group of um, civil society organizations as well as MESECVI monitoring mechanisms on the Bellum Dopara, Asian uh, Commission on Women's Rights, as well as working group on um, discrimination against women and girls that uh, supported the um, elaboration of supplementary instrument to the CEDO convention, this optional protocol. I am very glad that we are discussing again this third option, because at that time I have also supported that third option um, based on arguments that a standalone treaty uh, would um, um, 
uh, endanger what we have developed under the CEDAW Convention, and that there was a risk of isolating uh, provisions aimed at addressing gender-based violence against women from um, those addressing uh, discrimination against women because we are dealing with structural, the same structural causes of discrimination and violence against women. I also found that this uh, argument on a normative gap uh, uh, was not taking into consideration uh, that CEDAW committee and CEDAW convention uh, clearly explained that uh, gender-based violence against women is a form of discrimination against women. Myself, I was CEDO committee expert for 12 years. I was uh, also chairperson of the CEDO committee. And I have used that framework uh, in cases, jurisprudence of CEDO committee, uh, concluding observations related to elimination of violence against women. But nevertheless, after this uh, examination of all arguments, I have concluded that what we have now as a uh, international framework on violence against women based on CEDAW convention that is legally binding, but then uh, only authoritative interpretation, uh, general recommendation 19, 19 and 35, that are like a soft law um, instruments, then Beijing platform for action, and declaration on the elimination of violence against women. That was a very important instrument adopted in 93, but uh, soft law instrument, that this framework is, um, uh, difficult uh, for all those that are willing to use it, that uh, it is complex, it is fragmented, and in some way converted, and its application is uh, not, not user-friendly. So I have supported the idea of optional protocols of the CEDO Convention as a solution that could really uh, support implementation of that framework. But it would be also important to address normative challenges at the national level and how this optional protocol would help states to address those normative challenges. Uh, let me briefly mention that um, uh, during my term as a special reporter, I was jointly with CEDAW committee uh, working on elaboration of uh, general recommendation number 35 on gender-based violence against women that was adopted in 2017 and that upgraded general recommendation 19. And basically it was really an uh, attempt to upgrade and to include everything that was developed uh, between 92 and 217. Um, but what was clear when I was traveling as a special reporter to different states was a lack of knowledge. Uh, related to uh, implementation and use of general recommendation number 35. So we can ask the question, is it a problem with promotion, knowledge, or is it another problem that we need to face here? And basically, I think that um, we have to look also how others are promoting uh, work of the CEDAW committee. Here, I would like to briefly mention Commission on the Status of Women that have not sufficiently promoted uh, General Recommendation 35 of the CEDAW committee and the work of a special reporters in general. And for that reason, I have also proposed that uh, CSW or Commission on the Status of Women should include violence against women as a standing agenda item. So we need to have a bigger picture how we are progressing in this area in the future to really eliminate and combat violence against women. Uh, then uh, data were also mentioned by uh, um, current special reporter Imal Sardem, by uh, previous speakers and so on, that are showing that we are not progressing uh, in the right direction. Uh, additional data by statistical uh, uh, part of the UN are also showing that we would need more than 300 years to end child marriage, 286 years to close gap in legal protections to remove discriminatory laws. So this is all showing that we are uh, not progressing in the right direction. And for that reason, we need to accelerate implementation of CEDAW Convention and its general recommendation on violence against women. We need to upgrade those general recommendations from a soft law into legally binding supplementary instruments into optional protocol on violence against women. And here I would like again to congratulate core group of states that are starting this process. And this optional protocol will strengthen and complement and not um, undermine 
uh, implementation of the CEDO Convention because it will add something that is visible, explicit, and legally binding. Uh, very briefly, I was also involved in uh, elaboration of the Istanbul Convention at the level of the Council of Europe. Prior to uh, Istanbul Convention, Council of Europe had only soft law instrument recommendation on elimination of violence against women, but that soft law instrument was not able to produce changes that we are seeing now triggered at the national level of all those uh, states that have ratified Istanbul Convention. Now, after ratification, those states are changing their laws. Let me mention an example, for example, related to uh, standard related to uh, rape. So in Istanbul Convention, there is a new provision that definition of rape should be based on a lack of consent. The same standard was uh, applied by CEDAW committee in, the, in its jurisprudence, in Vertido case and other cases. As a special report, I have produced report on rape as a human rights violation and uphold the same standard. But those recommendations as a soft law, they have not produced those important changes, changes of the law at the national level as legally binding instruments are producing. So now with this effort to upgrade this framework into legally binding, we are going in direction of really having accountability of states with respect to promotion, protection, and uh, combating violence against women. Let me conclude by um, comparing this uh, global legal framework uh, and specific this part on violence against women with um, with a road that is now very uh, narrow, bumpy, and it's uh, still possible to use, but travel on this road is very, very slow. And it will be even slower during the different obstacles, like a uh, recent increase of uh, reporting time from four years to eight years for CEDAW committee state parties, what means that it is much longer period. At the same time, we are living in a modern world and we are building new roads in which we are traveling faster with better guidance. And adoption of this optional protocol on violence against women to the CEDAW would be like opening a new fast segment of this road that will accelerate this travel, that will, uh, that will give states a roadmap how to really go in all those areas needed uh, related to um, eliminating violence against women. So I hope that jointly we are going in this direction and I would like to also emphasize that it is unprecedented that we have current special reporter and former special reporters on violence against women joining the same cause. So we are really uh, at your disposal to support this cause. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Dubrovka Simonovic. Thank you so much. And I remind everybody, if you want to put your question in the Q&A, and uh, uh, now we are, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, we are giving the floor to Mrs. Rashida Manju, former United Nations Special Rapporteur on Rights Against Women and Girls. Mrs. Manju, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thank you, distinguished delegates. Um, as we say in South Africa, all protocol observed. So in two minutes, um, I'm not going to name everyone, but I would particularly like to thank the core group of friends who have taken on board the challenge of dealing with an intractable problem that we keep on talking about. And we know that accountability is not the norm. I just want to remind us a little bit. Um, I've heard a couple of our distinguished speakers the time is the time has come. The time is now, and you know the the issue of of timing. If one thinks back in 1991, the CSW was mandated to uh, to adopt uh, to develop a uh, violence against women treaty, uh, a standalone treaty. At that time in 1991, unfortunately, we ended up with a declaration. And as you know, Reem and Dubravka have, have noted, um, the challenge is that there will be pushback and we know that. Um, so in 1991, there was pushback and we ended up with a declaration, a soft law instrument, which set you know, certain standards. And then we had CEDAW general recommendations, um, the awareness you know, with general recommendation 12 that it's uh, 
member states were not necessarily reflecting in their reports to the treaty body, etc. And the first special rapporteur on violence against women did acknowledge in one of her reports that there was a normative gap in international law. There was no specific uh, treaty on violence against women and CEDAW being a 1979 instrument um, had covered it through its uh, concluding observations, jurisprudence, etc. So, you know, it's the time is now is actually the time was a while back in the 1990s and earlier. And we've just seen a continuation of the challenges over the years. The, as other speakers have noted, the statistics, the numbers that have gone up, the manifestations, the causes, consequences, etc., and the mandate being almost 30 years old, has through its thematic reports, its country mission reports, tried to address this. Um, the regional treaties, and as the distinguished um, a delegate from the DRC noted, the African Union is um, in the process of setting up a, um, a reference group. Um, and, you know, the president of South Africa had, during his tenure as the chair of the African Union, begun these discussions and I think it's quite exciting. We have the Maputo Protocol in Africa, uh, but we do need to uh, elaborate on these uh, more concretely, substantively on the issue. We have, you know, the Belem de Para, we have the Istanbul Treaty, etc. So in some ways, we stand in a very good position to fast track an optional protocol because we have these standards that have been set out either through legally binding instruments or in the jurisprudence of the different bodies. And we see the jurisprudence from the inter-American system, the African and the European system. So in some ways, I feel we are fortunate taking on the struggle now because we have this multitude of instruments, jurisprudence uh, reports from the special rapporteurs, uh, from the CEDAW committee, etc at our disposal to start thinking about uh, a framework for the optional protocol. As many of you know, I was in favor of a standalone treaty and the work of the Every Woman Coalition um, over the years and their conclusion that strategically, pragmatically, one needs to settle for an optional protocol, I think is, is the way to go. Um, as others have noted, you know, the multilateral system has become difficult. But I do think that in light of the statistics, in light of an optional protocol strengthening CEDAW, as opposed to weakening CEDAW, might be uh, something that uh, we can use. Another very important aspect for me has always been in my reports about how do we link the global to the local. And I think it was either Reem or Dubravka mentioned that, you know, when you do the country missions, you realize that there is a gap in the knowledge. So not only is a gap in the normative frameworks, but there's a gap in the knowledge base at the national level. And, you know, as special rapporteurs, we try as much as possible to address those gaps, both about the national level, the regional and the international, but to have an optional protocol that does the linkage between the global and the local without minimizing the standards. Because in the regional consultations that I uh, conducted uh, during my tenure, that was an issue that came up by some people. And the Council of Europe Treaty, the Istanbul Treaty was fairly new at that time. And there was a real concern um, that an international treaty might actually um, lead to a weakening of the standards that were in the regional treaty. I don't think that's necessarily true. There was a push by some um, European member states for, the, for everyone to adopt the Istanbul Treaty, but I do think it's very disrespectful to the rest of the world because it was a treaty developed for Europe. It's a regional treaty. It's not an international UN treaty. So my push has always been that we need to think about something at the international level. I am very grateful to the uh, core group of friends um, and also to Reem and Dubravka uh, for pushing this um, uh, issue forward with, of course, the coalition and others. And the fact that the uh, core group is open to an open-ended working group process, I think is a huge advantage because there are uh, women's rights organizations, individuals that would 
really add value to being part of these discussions. So thank you very much to all of you and particularly to the participants who have been part and parcel of discussions with the mandate of the Special Rapporteur. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mrs. Manjou. Um, and now uh, I, I, we would like to give the floor to Her Excellency Ambassador Shara Duncan Villalobos representing Costa Rica for the closing remarks. The floor is yours, Ambassador. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia. Good afternoon, everybody. It's it's very inspiring to be to be seated here today to talk to you and and to see all of you and to hear um, everything that has been said. Um, we all know that violence against women and girls is a pandemic, um, and as some have already said, is the most spread widespread uh, the most widespread human rights violation in the world. And this is the pandemic that we have continuously failed to tackle, but for which um, and for which we're not doing enough. Um, moreover, violence against women and girls continues to be an, obst an obstacle to achieving equality and development, peace, as well as the fulfillment of, of women and girls' human, human rights. All in all, the promise of the Sustainable Development Goals to leave no one behind cannot be fulfilled without putting an end to violence against women and girls. So in this sense, Costa Rica believes that gender equality and the empowerment of women constitute preconditions for sustainable development and integral human development. Real gender equality and women empowerment cannot take place in violent contexts. So the effective recognition of women's human rights and their implementation through policies, laws, and structural and cultural changes would lead to the development of more inclusive and democratic societies and greater economic social development of, of states. So it is actually also a good business idea. We are ready to take on the challenge of, of promoting this global effort, uh, not only in favor of women and girls, but to the benefit of society as a whole. We believe that it's time to generate uh, the necessary momentum and put the issue of violence against women in the international agenda as a priority. Um, and it is of the utmost importance that from the start, this collective effort guarantees the meaningful participation of all women, regardless of their age, um, place of birth, religion, personal condition, race, or disability. Because despite of the many commonalities in forms of violence, uh, they suffer their also relevant differences and specificities. This is why we have partnered with the Democratic Republic of Congo, with Antigua and Barbuda, and with Sierra Leone, and we will continue working together tirelessly to achieve the negotiation and adoption of, of an optional protocol to CEDO. We strongly believe the time is now, or as our former Special Rapporteur Rashida Manju just said, um, the time was in the 1990s. So we want to contribute in providing the international community that roadmap uh, that Reem talked about, that special um, um, roadmap to build upon the resources that we have available coming from the regional treaties, declarations, and the general comments from CEDAW without minimizing the standards as it, it has been said. We're very grateful for the support of, of, of current and two former special rapporteurs. I thank you for being with us today and your attention to this important initiative and all the work that you do. Um, and also to the civil society um, and human rights defenders that are connected to this call. Thank you for all the work that you do in your countries um, to put an end to this scourge. We're in this together and together we will manage to achieve our objectives. So thank you very much and over to you, Patricia. Thank you so much, Ambassador Shair Duncan, Duncan Villalobos, uh, representing Costa Rica for those closing remarks. Thank you, Excellency, for your unconditional commitment and leadership. We open the floor now for the Q&A. I will, I will be reading the question to our panelists. I must say that we have so much interaction. I'm really sorry, we will not be able to answer everything, but hopefully we are taking the question and maybe we'll, we can answer later by email for the person we cannot answer 
just there is one question asking like why in Kenya we cannot do this why in this country uh, why we are, aren't we talking about special specific, specific uh, countries our conflict or those uh, just to uh, tell everybody let everybody know we are talking in general worldwide we are not talking country by country and this optional protocol hopefully will help all women in all the world so everybody congratulates you, uh, uh, the core group of friends, the special reporter. And now I, I will take uh, many questions. Please, it, you will let me know who wants to reply. What is the main obstacle and change challenges that face the application of the violence stoppage and preventing measures? Uh, another one. As we have come long way, but still violence exists, how can we address the intersectionality of gender-based violence with other forms of discrimination, such as race, and ethnicity, and sexual orientation? Uh, uh, and, uh, and another question, three questions, and I will stop. Trinidad and Tobago are actively participating in the 16 days of activism, and we ask how can we in civil society do more, resident at uh, there is an email using the UN Women's Spotlight Initiative in rural communities and with the Trinidad and Tobago National Police Youth Groups with participation. I would say call Trinidad and Tobago to join the, 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 the friends of the optional protocol. And another question, in many regions, gender-based violence has cultural and social sanction and acceptance. How is it possible to address this through the optional protocol to CEDO? Implementation gaps are the main challenge to the efficacy of an international instrument. How will this be addressed? Please, ladies, let me and gentlemen, let me know who wants to answer what. Maybe a special reporter could start. I don't know. Uh, yeah, yeah, I can uh, maybe just say something with regards to the intersectionality. Obviously, this is uh, recognized, has been recognized. Uh, we see the relevance of this intersectional lens even more so today. I, I think uh, this is precisely one of the many things that we have to discuss also with member states of uh, what, what should remain in and what should be out, right, in terms of issues and, and, and topics. Uh, because I agree with Dubravka that so far I do not see any international platform where you can have really this comprehensive stock taking or discussion. Perhaps the CSW was meant to do that, but it really in the end ended uh, with, I mean, with all due respect to the CSW process, but um, there are lost opportunities in terms of uh, really uh, having these stock taking uh, discussions and, and, and reviews. Uh, it's, it's, ends up being very political process that is focused on the resolution or the end of uh, CSW statement, you know? So, so hopefully this process of creating an optional protocol may get us to have these in-depth discussions and reviews that are so, so needed, including um, with the, yeah, with civil society and with victims. Thank you, Special Rapporteur, because I see that you have uh, already answered many questions. <laughs> by 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 written uh, that's uh, somebody else wants to intervene please yes mrs dubravka um on on a point just raised by uh special reporter Rimar Salem related to the csw it seems that now states are discussing possibility to enhance or reform csw and maybe that would be also right mm -hmm. more to look into what is the real mandate of the CSW and how we are using it only to focus on uh, negotiations of agreed conclusions that are not real implementation tool. And here I would like to recall that EDVA platform, platform of all uh, UN mechanisms, uh, monitoring implementation of uh, UN framework, what is CEDAW committee, 
uh, working group on discriminatory laws and special rapporteur on violence against women and regional mechanisms like Mesekri, Gravio and special rapporteurs. They all supported the idea that uh, we should have interactive dialogue at the CSW between uh, CEDAW committee experts, special rapporteurs, regional mechanisms, and have different type of discussions related to what is really needed. What are those implementation strategies? And now I'm going back to questions uh, related to main obstacles to combat and prevent violence against women. And this is something what I have seen uh, during uh, discussions of what is really needed to go into protection side, let's protection for victims. For example, 24 or seven helplines are needed in all states. It should be clearly explained. Uh, then uh, shelters, which type of shelters, how to organize shelters, who is paying shelters, are NGOs organizing shelters. Shelters should not be seen as something uh, voluntarily supported by states. It should be seen as something that is part of the human rights obligations related to prevention of violence against women. Then protection orders. Protection orders should be part of that to, to protect uh, victims from domestic violence, gender-based violence, to have efficient and good protection orders. When I have visited different states, there are uh, huge problems with really standards on protection orders and understanding that victims with their children should stay at home and perpetrators should be expelled, irrespectful of who is owing the property and so on. So there are uh, steps that should be considered. So we need this clear roadmap, this clear explanation, what is needed on that road, what types of uh, uh, violence against women and girls should be in a criminal law and what should be maybe in uh, other parts of the law. So we need that type of discussions. For example, um, uh, question was raised about different cultural and social approvals of uh, different harmful practices and so on. So this is a learning process, but they should be criminalized if they are, for example, at the level of criminalization. First step is criminalization, and of course they should be the whole process should raise uh, uh, understanding at the national level through uh, uh, parliamentary discussions and so on, that this should be outlawed. And then we need a huge promotional campaigns in order to stop such practices and to uphold international law in this respect, because CEDO Convention is clear on uh, with respect to those uh, uh, harmful practices and cultural practices that are not in line with international standards. And still they are persistent, still they are there, still we are not really seeing uh, fast and accelerated uh, removal of those uh, of those uh, uh, forms of violence against women. We also need a better support for CETO committee, for work of the committee, it's uh, for work under optional protocol, because many cases are pending and they should be uh, examined by CEDAW committee. So we need guidance from uh, CEDAW committee and we also need uh, this uh, new legally binding roadmap that will clearly uh, point out to states uh, how to go in this direction. And I think that um, uh, elaboration of Istanbul Convention was a good example how this could be done. Because during discussions uh, um, at the Council of Europe level, it was clear that many uh, states uh, at the level of the Council of Europe did not know properly what are those standards. Now we need to move this discussion at the global level, and this elaboration of a protocol will open up this discussion. This is going to be also a learning process. This is going to be a process to all of us to see what are those good practices, what are good laws, what um, the practices are then decreasing uh, femicides. And here I would also recall uh, idea of a femicide watch and the data that we are collecting through that uh, initiative and so on. So thank you. I will stop here and maybe come later on other questions. As we have like 10 minutes more, uh, former Special Rapporteur Mrs. Manju, please. Thanks, Patricia. I, I'm looking at the question on global local strategies to counter the resistance to an international legal framework uh, apart from education. And I, you know, it's good that we are aware of that. One of the things that I've suggested is that to do the global local link, we need to, in an optional protocol or a standalone treaty, as I argued previously, 
we should build in, um, like in the Disability Treaty, the Rights of Migrant Workers Treaty, uh, the Convention Against Torture, the establishment of a preventative mechanism at the national level. And so, you know, part of that discussion is the discussion happens at the local level for a UN treaty, offshore protocol, at the same time, having this clause in that um, a law allows for discussions at the national level. Within the UN system, I think it's really important to, um, through the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, have the adoption of a resolution. And this is a message to my colleagues in the core group of friends. Uh, to have a resolution about the setting up of, of an open-ended working group. And we've seen this in developments on the business and human rights um, working group and the consultations, the dialogues, et cetera, which allow for a much broader input from across the globe before the treaty actually is drafted and comes into being. So I think an open-ended working group through a resolution by both the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly is really imperative for our friends in member states to think about. Um, and I think the fact that uh, we have many frameworks already, it, it allows for national level dialogues because there are countries with really good legislation, right? And they will contribute to strengthening what we want in an international treaty. So I do think the dialogical approach that the UN adopts, the Human Rights Council in particular, and the General Assembly, um, people will feel a sense of ownership and there might be less resistance. And we've seen this with the Istanbul Treaty. There was push and pull factors, there was resistance, but there was also acceptance. And it was part of being an inclusive, transparent process. And if we can get achieve that within the UN system, um, I think that that tension between the global and local might be lessened. Um, I had one other point. The question from Cheryl about impunity being the most intractable problem. We do know that, but we do also recognize that as long as we don't close that normative gap in international law, we are not setting standards that member states can adopt. So we have the regional treaties and we can argue with the UN treaty, the regional treaties to start closing those gaps at the national level in terms of um, the lack of accountability where impunity is the norm. Thank you. Thank you. I ha we have a very interesting uh, question. Is uh, I wonder if the panelists would like to share their opinion as to the monitoring body that should oversee compliance with that protocol. Do you support the creation of a separate treaty body such as a CEDO subcommittee similar to the torture subcommittee? Uh, yeah, and um, and also another lady, this is one question. The other, I, we have two questions on this and another that uh, says that we man has to be also, uh, uh, has to be uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the process. And there's one question for Mr. Mubarak Idris. How does traditional and toxic masculinity intersect with GBV? And what are the effective strategies for redefining masculinity and promoting healthy respect for relationships and behaviors among men and boys? Uh, can we, uh, ladies, who wants to answer about uh, the monitoring body for the CEDO? Mrs. Dubrovka? Um, I think that this this is going to be part of the whole discussion, and this is on states and also CEDO committee and other mechanisms to discuss because we need to see what are good practices, what is coming out. Uh, we need to see what is current uh, framework of CEDO committee's work because uh, uh, this uh, prolongation of reporting from four years to eight years is really a sign that process is going to be longer. So this is an element that should be considered. It would be also important to see that, for example, at the level of uh, Istanbul Convention, uh, experts are traveling to countries and uh, uh, observing and discussing situations related to violence against women. 
So there are possibilities that CEDO committee members could be um, empowered to travel to countries or maybe subcommittee could be established and so on. So there are different opportunities. We have to see how to achieve the best possible results at the end. So I think that this question should be integrated in the whole process of uh, uh, discussing this uh, framework, how to make it more efficient, more um, more clear for states. Uh, and uh, also we need to clarify that those that would not like to use this, uh, let's, let's say, uh, new road, new optional protocol, they still have old road and uh, see the framework. So we are not losing anything. We are just gaining a possible additional tool that will really promote this idea of every woman's right to live life free from violence. And I would also like, like to mention uh, Bell and the Para Convention because it was the first convention adopted uh, uh, on elimination of violence against women. I have recently participated at uh, one meeting dedicated to elaboration of uh, model law on digital violence. What is also a good example how uh, different areas could be addressed by um, uh, regional mechanisms, but they are also calling for universal ratification of this treaty. And this call on one side from uh, uh, those that have uh, ratified Istanbul Convention and those that have ratified Belém do Pará for further ratifications from other groups are really showing that we need something like this at a global level. So I think that this core group has very good arguments now in hands with support of current special reporter, former special reporters, and I hope also support of CEDO committee experts that need to see that this will strengthen uh, their work under the CEDO Convention, that we will progress, as was mentioned by uh, uh, a former reporter Manju in a fast uh, speed kind of uh, track uh, in elaboration of this optional protocol. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Rima Sam and former special reporter Man Madame Manju, but uh, also the there is a, a question maybe for uh, Mrs. Rashida. What will be the roadmap to have optional protocol to CEDO on VAUC? So to add yeah, just very quickly then, uh, Patricia, to add to what Dubrovka said, uh, I, I think we can start definitely by reviewing the pros and cons of existing monitoring mechanisms of international and regional treaties and uh, build on, on the... Um, uh, the things that work, you know, if it's not broken, uh, if it's, uh, yeah, if it's not broken, why fix it? So if something works, we should definitely uh, take it on. But uh, in order not to weaken these regional uh, mechanisms and uh, to, to work more um, more effectively with them, there needs to be a, um, a formal relationships established avenues uh, of communication and engagement between this body and the regional uh, uh, bodies that exist already. And third, uh, it was already mentioned very briefly, and I put something to that effect in the notes, but the issue of resources, we cannot continue really to, to be mechanisms without teeth because of the lack of resources to do all kinds of things. I mean, that, that has to be really resolved once and for all. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Manjur? Thanks, Patricia. I uh, I am covered, but I just think that strategically for a roadmap, I mean, we have the core group of friends and we have RIM. So in some ways within the UN system, we have the solid foundation, which we never had previously, right? Um, during my tenure, then, you know, there was, Canada was very supportive of my thematic reports, but Canada wasn't supportive in the way that I felt it should be around this issue. So I do think we have the foundation um, with the core group and REAM to, to, to discuss and negotiate about, for me, the roadmap would be to get a resolution through the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly, setting up a working group as quickly as possible. And that the working group with, with Reem, of course, um, being fundamental as the current special rapporteur, uh, being part of that process, who can then call on the rest of us. So that for me is a starting point of any roadmap uh, to take us forward on this discussion. Uh, and Reem, of course, has the opportunity to be in touch with the CEDAW and other treaty bodies and colleagues within the special procedures system as well. 
Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe we can let uh, um, Mr. Uh, yes, Idris uh, answer his question. All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Patricia. Many persons are asking for the positive masculinity and how we can have men supporting. Oh, yes. When it comes to traditional and toxic masculinity, the one thing that it brings about is harmful behaviors and attitudes. I had a friend during my industrial training, and one day he said his father saw him laughing too much, and then he flogged him. Like, what's the reason? You need to have a reason why you do things or why you show emotions. So it has brought about an emotional repression where a man does not feel the need to show, you know, um, an emotional expression because they feel I need to be a real man and all. And that is quite harmful because it's like filling up a tank. At some point, it's going to get filled up and then it's just going to splash if there's no proper outlet to do that. So the first thing that we should start teaching men in terms of strategies is that it is okay to feel vulnerable. It is okay to talk. Because you're a man doesn't mean that you shouldn't be scared and you shouldn't share things. Because if you do not have an outlet to share, sometimes it turns out to frustration and frustration often leads to violence if not being controlled. Another thing that's quite important is that we need to start having positive role models that speak up and speak out about these uh, you know, stereotypes and biases that are always talked about. It's not enough to just not participate in the stereotypes and biases, it's important to actually serve as a champion and be a role model and set that example. And it's very important in terms of, you know, the kids that are coming up nowadays, because you can tell someone to do something, but our actions will always judge our intentions because it's what they see their fathers doing, it's what they see their brothers and their uncles doing. That's what they are definitely going to copy. So these are the things that we need to do in order to build a supportive environment to curb traditional and, you know, toxic masculinity. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have also this remark that uh, is saying, including male Muslim faith leaders and this good initiative, inclusivity is important. We are all uh, okay with that. Uh, we came to the end of our uh, event. Uh, thanks to all for participating. Um, Honorable Samantha, would you like to say a word? Ambassador Shara, would you like to say a word before closing this meeting? Madam Minister, is she going to, to say a word? So I could give her the space. Okay, um, I, I would like to just once again, thank you. Thank all of you for being with us. Thank uh, Every Woman Coalition. Thank you to the current Special Rapporteur um, and thank you to the former Special Rapporteurs and also to the to the Honorable uh, Minister of Antigua and Barbuda. Um, we're very happy to, to, to work together with you and, and to start this process. And um, I'm pretty sure, as I said before, that we will we will achieve our objective if we continue to work in, together. And, and just since you are members of civil society, I think it is very, very important that you are engaged, that you call um, on your countries to support the initiative, that you call on your authorities to join this effort. Um, and and I, I have been in many negotiations of, of uh, resolutions and, and, and instruments, and you can really feel the difference when you have the support of civil society. So don't think that because you are in your countries, you don't have a voice at the international level, you do. And um, and it's important that, that you raise your voice and that you collect signatures and that you make a lot of movement around this optional protocol. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, 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 Minister Samantha Marshall. Do you want to say a word? Yes, um, let me thank all the um, participants and everyone for who has given support to us to be able to um, have this forum. I think it's indeed important that we do focus on the whole issue of the elimination of um, violence against women and girls. This is a critical area for us as all member states to focus on. And although it is not going to be easy in every um, jurisdiction, it is important that we prioritize and maintain our fight against this terrible scourge. 
We see what is happening um, in, in different um, jurisdictions as a result of war and the level of violence that is levied against um, different our women and our girls. We see what's happening within the Caribbean, the Latin American states all over. And so this is critical. Just as been said by many, uh, it's not about always having to adopt and use the same methodology to try to deal with it, but for us to learn and to build on what we're doing from each other so that we're able to fight the scourge. I want to thank everyone and I want to be on record as giving my full commitment as the minister with responsibility for gender affairs within Antigua and Barbuda to have my voice heard in this fight and to do whatever is necessary to give full support. Thank you so much. Uh, we have also Minister Judy that uh, is supporting. I mean, uh, we, uh, we thank everybody. We thank uh, our four nations. Uh, Costa Rica, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Demot Democratic Republic of, uh, of uh, Congo and Sierra Leone. We thank very much uh, the Special Rapporteur, Reem Salem, former Special Rapporteur, Mrs. Dubrovka Simonovic and Mrs. Rashida Manju. We thank our activist, Mubarak Idrisi. Thank you. And I will say to be followed. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you. Thanks also to all the um, spectators, participants from all over the world. And, and we sorry, thank you, Patricia. Also, we thank uh, One Woman uh, Treaty Coalition. Thank for you so all much. Its work behind the scenes on this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And to be followed. Thank you. Il faut, il faut éteindre. Non, il y a encore. Let us stay. Let us rest with. Oui.